Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. And now, here is your host, the lovely, delightful, insightful, and all-around great gal, Ms. Barbara DeLong. Welcome everybody to Nightlight. This is Barb DeLong, your host, and I have with me tonight, today, an amazing author who is bringing forward to us somebody that, um, frankly, I haven't spoken a lot about, but who is somebody that we all want to get to know a little bit better because his philosophies do blend in so much with ours. I have the author of Infinite Possibility, How to Use the Ideas of Neville Goddard to Create the Life You Want by Catherine Jedigy. Um and she is an amazing lady. She is um, a British television presenter and author with a background in science. She's for, she was first introduced to metaphysics as a teenager by her mother, a former yoga teacher and education specialist. She developed a penetrating and enduring fondness for self-empowering the, the self-empowering teachings of Neville Goddard and remains just as steadfastly devoted to spreading his message today. After completing her studies, Kate moved to Switzerland to work with the World Health Organization, developing educational resources for rural communities in sub-Saharan Africa, African. Uh, in addition to her academic science career, Kate has worked with the BBC Science Unit and BBC Radio Oxford and served as news editor of the international journal Africa Health for whom she has conducted research trips, helping to set up learning resources and study center at one of Nigeria's forefront teaching hospitals. She's been published in the internationally acclaimed science journal Nature and has also presented two science series aimed at young adults for Channel 4 in the UK, earning a BAFTA nomination. She lives in London. She's currently in Nigeria and happily she is here with us. Welcome Kate to the show. Thank you, Barbara. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, I'm looking forward to this because to tell you the truth, um, I didn't know a lot about Neville Goddard. Um, however, <laughs> however, his philosophies I have been preaching for a very long time. So a part of me has been connected to him. Um, and and I find that, that his story is in an amazing one. So you, you want to fill us in from your standpoint and I'll jump in when I actually know something? Sure. So um, if I start by talking about Neville himself, he is of English heritage, um, English, Scottish and Irish. And he was actually born on the island of Barbados in 1905. And sometimes when people hear about Europeans in the West Indies or the Caribbean and Africa, they kind of think these wealthy colonial families. But his family wasn't like that. They were a family of very modest means and very beloved, actually, by their community and the people that they lived um, among. 
And Neville himself was a fairly precocious child. He was, um, had a pioneering spirit, which was actually identified by a prophet in Barbados when he was around eight years old. And he was told that he was going to go on and be a minister of God and to spread this wonderful message that we now know he, him for. And so when he was a young man, a teenager, in fact, he left Barbados and traveled to New York. And he was pursuing a career on stage and um, had some success as a dancer and an actor. But it wasn't um, a huge success. It was it was a modest success. And the thing that's really interesting about Neville um, is that later on, still as a young man in his 20s, he was introduced by a friend to an Ethiopian rabbi called Abdullah, who he went on to study the Bible and Kabbalah and mysticism and things like that for about five years. And out of that work with um, Abdullah, his ministry was born. The thing that was really interesting, though, about Neville is that um, his sense of adventure that brought him to America in the first place um, wasn't satisfied by his life on stage. He had this hunger for something great, and he was able to find that through his calling in this ministry that we know him for. He was, you know, I, I find it fascinating that that um, Abdullah, you know, really um, worked with him with Hebrew, the Kabbalah, the symbolic meaning of scripture. I mean, you know, this is an amazing man. And, and mm -hmm. apparently when first he met him, um, he, he went reluctantly to a lecture and, and Abdullah greeted him and said, you know, kind of it's about time. I've been waiting yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He, he was, Neville was a little bit um, apprehensive because the person who introduced him to Abdullah was a man, a friend of his, but someone who, whose judgment Neville found questionable, someone who <laughs> squandered a large inheritance. And so he thought, OK, this is not someone I want to take advance, um, advice from. But yes, as you say correctly, Barbara, Abdullah said, yeah, you're six months late. <laughs> the, the brothers <laughs> told me you were coming. It's about time. And he also said he was waiting for him. I thought that was so beautiful. I, I cried when I read that part of the story, that he was waiting for Neville to come before he departed this physical plane. Well, and the, he studied with him for a number of years, didn't he, before Abdullah finally took off and went his own way? Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Spiritually speaking. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think what I love about his work um, I mean, he's been called a prophet, and I and I would absolutely agree totally that that the techniques and the the, the processes that he spoke of and that he has shared um, do put him in that category, and yet he doesn't seem to have taken on the air of a prophet. You know, he was out there to spread a message, and that's what he did, and he didn't get um, blown away by by the glamour or the glory of, of people, you know, using his techniques and, and saying how wonderful he was. He he had a, he had a goal. He had a message, and he fulfilled that. And he didn't get blown away by all of the attention that was given him because of it. Absolutely. I mean, Neville was somebody who was who said to people, don't deify me. He was very uh, reluctant for people to take autographs and photographs and things like that because he didn't want people to get caught up in a personage. We know as human beings, we tend to look to someone to, to worship or to follow. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that this message isn't about me, Neville. I'm a messenger telling you about you. And that's what I find um is applies to me in my own work. I have people saying, well, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you trying to raise your profile, your brand? I'm saying I don't have a profile <laughs> or a brand. I just have a message. And it's about every last one of us. And I think the thing uh, that happens to a lot of people, sadly, sometimes, not all the time, is that they do get caught up when people seem to respond to them rather than what they're saying or doing. And that's, I absolutely love that about Neville because he was consistent oh, yeah. in that from beginning to end. No, I, I know that every now and then, I've been in the field for like 50 years, and so, often somebody will say, well, what do the people who follow you think? And I said, I, I would be horrified to think anyone was following me. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> and it's, it's sort of like I'm still on this journey. I'm sharing, uh, I'm sharing what I'm gathering with everybody, but, you know, pff, I have no idea where it's going. So, so yeah, I, I appreciate that of him, and and he did get that that 
he he did get the attention so that it it it, it would have been it would have been almost logical for him to get get blown away by it but he didn't and he was really i think he had specifics that he had to share and he did a brilliant job of it um his message is out there for those who are ready for it to find and to learn from and though your book is only and i have to look exactly how many pages it is is only 120 pages one would pick it up look at it say big print i can get by i can get through this in a day and that's true you can but what you're holding in your hand is an amazing bomb i mean you've got information here that can radically change someone's life if they want to do the work oh well i'm so glad that you you've said it like that you know i there's uh, Neville's books himself, with the exception of one or two, were not exhaustive. And he said that's deliberately the case. The message is a very straightforward one. It's a very simple one. It's telling people that there is not an aspect of self, but an entirely new perspective that's awaiting them. And at the moment, most of us consider consciousness or spirituality to be a part of who we are, when in actual fact, our human experience is a part of that authentic being of consciousness. And so it's just helping people to understand it in very simple terms. Yeah. Well, it's not so simple. It changes their life <laughs> radically. I mean, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, have, I have said to people frequently, you know, you create your, right, your reality by your perception of it. And they just look at me like, are you crazy? And it's like, no. <laughs> it's simple. But, but, but you, you have made a connection that, that – or he made a connection – I don't know who made it. The connection was made that our imagination is so much more than just make believe. It is, in essence, the spirit that we are. Absolutely. I think one of the things that happens, you know, he says, um, your imagination is God. And a lot of people shrink away from that idea because most of us have this idea that God is a religious figure. But actually what he's saying is the source creator, the substance of everything in existence is the imagination. It's the same thing, one of the same thing. What we've been told is that our imagination is a faculty of the human mind that enable, enables us to perceive things that aren't in physical existence. But Neville saying that that's not what it is. Actually, it is the source from which everything that is in existence comes. And I think that's an important distinction to make. And, and I think that's the thing that changes people's lives. If they can really understand that and grasp that, embrace that, then that's the thing that's going to be life changing for them. Well, I think it empowers the individual and that's that's where I think a lot of people stumble because so many people feel that they are victims or that they don't have the power or the control or the ability and the reality is it's all right there. It's 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 open the door and embrace it, then use it in your life. And so many people just don't recognize the fact that there is that door there for them to open and your book um is brilliantly written because it is it, it speaks simple language you're not using you know you're not using a lot of the the buzzwords that connect it to spirituality and though it is metaphysics you're not saying it and um so so you know a lot of people I hope will will um, make the effort to read it because it does change your life. It gives you the tools. It says, here it is, silver platter. Be in control of your own destiny. Make it happen. And but again, there's that there there's that codicil. You know, if you want to do the work. Mm -hmm. I and, think this is the thing. Sorry, continue. No, no, and 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 that's that's what it is. It's you know, many people just want a wand to be waved over their heads and them to be, you know, in charge of everything. And that's not the case. It, it, we're here to, to learn how to do the work to use the tools we bring into this lifetime. And it's absolutely o it's OK if they don't want to, to. Oh, excuse me. That's my clock. I forgot to take it off the wall. <laughs> it's going to I'm usually doing the show at night, so it, it's it's. It will just play for a minute. But I think what what really is so important is that 
getting into that stage, that level of cognition, that ability to shift and, and alter your reality is work. It doesn't happen overnight, but it's there for you if you want to work for it. Absolutely. And, and what Neville says and, and what I've tried to echo in my own writing is that um, it's simple, but it's not necessarily easy. So it does take work. It does take a commitment. But often what gets misconstrued about it is that through putting in that work, you're learning something. I think that's the thing that gets missed. So it's not learning something for learning its sake. It's actually doing something for you. We are here in the world to rediscover who we truly are. And we do that through a process of education that the meaning or the purpose for which is revealed to us later on in the journey. But we have to start that work. And this is why Neville says it takes so much courage to take that first step because you're thinking, well, what am I doing this for? I understand that we're promised all sorts of goodies. You know, you can create the life you want and all of that kind of thing. And that's not where it stops. He's talking about something much more important and significant that we don't actually recognize as human beings until we break through the veil. And we do that through engaging with the work that Neville taught and which I am retelling today. Well, I think one of the, I, a long time ago, I wrote a thing, you can be a parrot or a prophet. So many people are mem memorize facts and memorize philosophies even, and, and they just spew them, you know, chapter and verse, they spew them back at people and, and expect people to think that they're wise and, and, you know, and brilliant beyond all comparison. But the reality is they're just being a parrot to someone else's words. And to go the other step, to, to take information in, to embrace it and live your life according to it makes you a, an example of the wisdom that has been shared and that makes you the prophet and and i i think that's what he did too you know you you have to embrace this you have to become the philosophy in order to utilize the tools absolutely and it's all about consciousness so when you think about um, people talk about manifesting or, or di disciplining their imagination and learning to um, create the things they want. This is a process of becoming something. And that's what has happened to me through my study of Neville's work. I have become that work. And I am so excited. I said to my mom, you know, she always used to say to me as a young person, all she ever wanted was for me to be happy. And she wasn't always clear about why she was saying that to me. And I said the happiest moment of my life was actually discovering what I was, what I truly am, and being able to live as an authentic being. It is, it, 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 um, it frees you. It frees you because it gives you, you know that you have control and, and you have control over all aspects of this lifetime, which I think is, is, is so phenomenal. And you can even go back and you know, something I tell people, people will say to me, oh, I had this horrible dream. And, and I say to them, well, go back and change it. Mm -hmm. You know, and they look at me like, are you crazy? And, and it's, no, you don't like the way a dream ended? Go back. And I, I have often gotten up and said no and gone right back to bed and re rewritten the dream because it, it felt better for me. And mm -hmm. I, it, it's something we can do with our life. Um, he, he speaks often about the law and, and, you know, you have to live in accordance with the law. And, you know, he's not specific exactly to what the law is, but, but it, it feels to me as though it, it is, you know, they are the universal truths. Um, yes, that's certainly um, a part of it. So what Neville, what he means by the law, and this took me actually a while to discover for myself. So what he means by the law is the I am statement. And it's saying that I am the door, I am the way, which are the uh, directives given in the Bible, in biblical text for those familiar with the Bible, right? So uh -huh. what he's saying is that we don't look to uh, external resources or external persons to give us the thing we want, but we must learn how to become the consciousness of the thing we desire using the I am. So that is the law, the law of being. And it's uh, something that everybody can develop within themselves and learn to use for themselves. So if, uh, for example, if somebody's unwell and a doctor tells them that 
this is the end or whatever it might be, they can declare I am healthy. Now, I don't want to go too far down the health route because we know that sometimes ill health takes people out. Is there exit? So I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about if it's something you can recover from, you say I am healthy. So you become the consciousness of health or if you need money, you say I am wealth or I am abundance or whatever it might be. So that just to help people to be more clear about the law, because it is it is difficult to identify through, with an initial reading of his work um, that this is what he's talking about. It's knowing that your change, the change you're looking for comes through you recognizing yourself to be something. Oh, and yeah. this is what I tried to help people to do in the book. I, I know a long time ago, um, gosh, maybe 40 years ago, uh, I was told I had ulcerative colitis and that I was going to die from it. And at the time, I wasn't as heavily into this field as I am now. And I just looked at the doctor and I, you know, somebody had just given me a death sentence, basically. And I looked at him and the first thing out of my mouth was, I don't have time. I have too much to do. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, that's not going to be the case. Now, f fast forward 40 years, I did not die. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do not have that illness. Um, it was it was just, and my mother at the time was very upset, and I said, look, I don't have time for that. I have lots of things I have to do, and I won't accept it. Now, that isn't always the case with everything, but with every fiber of my being, I did not accept it. Right. And that's what you, that's what he, he, pre, pre, he didn't preach, he shared. Um, I, you know, I don't want to put him in a pulpit because this wasn't a religious philosophy. This was a way of life. There's, this is, you know, a philosophy to live your life by. It's not a religion to worship. So, but but that's basically what the I am is. I am in control. I am the one that is creating this. And if I choose to not create something, I won't create it. Absolutely. And what you've described is the law in operation. So when people say they're, they, they're not sure what we're talking about, that is it. That's an example of the law, recognizing something and consenting to its reality. Yeah, and, you know, when, when you originally came to this work, it was a threshold for you into a whole other aspect of life. And it happened when you were in your 20s. You had a traumatic event and you used his material to get you through it. Yeah, I mean, we were introduced to um, new thought in general as children. So I, I actually allude to this in my second book, that when we were young, my mother, she would read to us often. We always had evening story time and, and, and all of that. And interestingly enough, alongside all the traditional children's classics were new thought authors as well. So although we weren't familiar with what we were hearing or didn't fully understand it, it was the seeds, I would say, were being planted. When I was about 14 or 15, my mother gave me um, a Neville Goddard book and I read it and I didn't understand it, didn't really love it. <laughs> but again, more of that, you know, planting was taking place. And then I came to, to study it in a more meaningful way. The, the event that you refer to, which I talk about in the book, I don't go into detail. Mm -hmm. um, some people who know me know what happened, but um, it was that point uh, when I came back to his philosophy because I, I reached that point of saying, well, you know what? I can't do this anymore. This hasn't worked. Something I built my life on has failed me in a really terrible way. And so I was faced with this challenge. Do I give up on it or do I go over what I thought I knew? So perhaps my approach was faulty rather than the philosophy itself. And I went through everything with a fine tooth comb. And really, I'm so grateful that I made that decision because I came out of that process of which I say the trauma I went through was a part. Um, the person I am today. I have the information I have today. I have the power. I have the inspiration and all of the things I have today as a result of that process. So it was um, many, many hours. I couldn't tell you, Barbara, how many <laughs> hours of study, but it was done with, you know, thesauruses and Bibles and dictionaries and everything and going over and my highlighter pens and my notebooks. And I, and I went through it 
um, very, very, in a very, very detailed way. I practiced and practiced and practiced the techniques because I wanted to make sure that I left no stone unturned. I think I was sort of looking for a way to accuse Neville of being wrong in some way, that the fault wasn't mine, but it, it was kind of twisted. But in the end, I became the, the person I am, the product of that study. Well, and, and you know, I think that's a good way to go about it. You know, uh, I, I recently interviewed someone that had a past life experience and he was a homicide detective and he decided to prove that there is no such thing as reincarnation. And using all of his techniques, he, he, he managed to beautifully prove that there is such a thing as reincarnation. <laughs> <laughs> Much to his dismay. Um, so, and but I think the the cool and for those listening, you know, it's it's a small book, and I would highly recommend you buy it. Um, but you do give exercises in here to help people get on the way to to understand the process, to experience what it is they're 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 looking towards, and the the biggest stumbling block I can see is people's concept of God, you know, everybody's concept is different, but many believe it's a person out there as opposed to a person in here, even though they will admit that, that what gives them life and animation is the part of the infinite that they carry within them. They don't recognize it as, as God. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, it, it's sort of, you know, you are God, you are, you you are a part of creation. You are creation. Ergo, you can become a creator. Absolutely. And people think, um, uh, and those who already are maybe uh, of the Christian faith or whatever, or familiar with the Bible and all of that kind of thing, can look to, for clues that confirm what you've just said. We have to be imitators as dear children. We have to do what the father does, which is become creators just as a father is a creator and father in the biblical sense of the word. So I, I know people get sensitive about language, God, father, and all of that. And I would encourage people, if these words are offensive to them, to put them down and choose other terms. I am unapologetic about the language I use because I understand understand its meaning. But as you rightly said, it has no religious connotation. The beautiful thing about this process is as people begin to engage with these exercises, they will make this discovery for themselves. So from my perspective, growing up um, in a Christian, uh, from a Christian background, I actually found Neville's work quite offensive with a first reading. But the thing that was beautiful about it, even though I was resist resistant in the beginning, <laughs> um, I uh, couldn't escape the way it made me feel. And I I found that time and time again, um, even somebody who is a minister of a church wrote to me on Facebook um, in a message and said that she was struggling with it, but she couldn't deny that the, the writing made her feel a particular way. Not just my book, but Neville's writing itself mm -hmm. made her feel something. And so what I would say to people is just retain an open mind. It's not asking you to give up what you believe at any point. It's asking you to open your mind and to embrace a new perspective. What you then do with what you believe is entirely up to you, but that's the beauty of it. It's actually something Neville says is inevitable. This discovery that we are God is an inevitable one. I would, yeah, I agree with you. And, and what I love is, you know, he says, it, it's, it's okay if you don't want to take on that philosophy this time or next time or the next time, eventually, it will come to roost within you. I mean, it's 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 not. This lifetime is not a one-shot deal. Therefore, um, you know, you you will grow and you will come to this point in time, eventually. I I think that what what I love about what he's what he has written that coincides with with you know my personal belief system is that there are no coincidences, and so that so that when you are making something happen and evolve within and and he doesn't say um i i believe um he doesn't say you have to focus on all the things that come to make something happen you just if if what you want to happen is that important to you 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 imagine it you be it you become it and basically, in, in my terms, you let the universe figure out how it's going to happen. You just 
know that it's supposed to happen and, and the more you believe in it and the more that you see it and the more that you feel it, you, you, you literally make it happen. Absolutely. That is exactly what he says. And, and there's the beauty of that is that um, when we actually try to figure things out, I was reading uh, yesterday or the day before um, in Neville's books, he talks about how because you're viewing what you want from your present position where that thing doesn't presently exist, you're seeing it as something that's going to be beyond your reach. You can't quite work out how. And we become frustrated. We shut down inspiration. We shut down the flow of energy that will make that thing happen because we're focused on how it's going to happen. So it's wonderful that we are completely uh, relieved of that responsibility. We have no, we don't need to concern ourselves in any way whatsoever with the how something is going to happen. We're just here to consent to it being so. Well, yeah, I think it was um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, what, what I find fascinating is he the story is told about Abdullah and and um, and Neville saying he wanted to go back to Barbados and 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 Abdullah told him to feel it to feel you know walk the streets to go into the house and everything and that, that it would happen and it, it he 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 worked on it for I don't know how long three months six months whatever it was and he kept saying look this doesn't work and he said keep going keep keep imagining it keep keep working on it and then suddenly um, he got a letter from his brother that said they wanted um, him to come home for, for a, a time and he sent him the money for the ticket and Neville was so excited he went to Abdullah and he said he, he had booked it but but that um, he had to take third class and Abdullah said no no first class you should go <laughs> yeah. first class and and so he went back to you know the visualization not the visualization he went back to imagining himself there and when he got to the boat um they informed him that someone had canceled and he was going to go first class so it, it's it's believing in something so so hard that reality is created around that belief um, absolutely. And, and the thing that's really uh, important, I, well, for me, that's important to, to tell people is that this is not at all vague or euphemistic. You're the the person who reads my book, who reads Neville's books, are guided in how to do that, how to walk the streets of some place you want to go to or mm -hmm. to um, smell something or to see something or to taste something. You're taught how to do it because what you're doing is training yourself to use your subjective senses. So if you think of your physical being as having, uh, so you're training yourself to use your, yes, your subjective senses. You have objective senses of taste, touch, sight, hearing and, and uh smell or whatever it is I, I forget <laughs> but you, you we have our senses our natural senses that we use to engage the physical world around us we also as our consciousness being have those same senses and what Neville is teaching and what I'm teaching again in my book is how to strengthen those senses and that's the thing that makes the thing happen that's the thing that anchors you in this new reality so it's a wonderful process it's very practical it's very real and very very tangible I just want to share something very quickly Barbara sure um, I I travel a lot and um, don't spend a huge amount of money so I just get a typical coach seat and you know and I, I go up and down and, and do what I have to do but there was a time when I wanted to travel uh, first class and I <laughs> didn't spend uh, the ticket but I saw myself in the lounge and saw myself on that wonderful seat that folds out into the bed and all the rest of it oh, yeah. and and I did that. And because it's so uh, natural, such a natural part of me now, it's a little bit tricky to say to someone, oh, it took me so many hours or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I just I just did that, um, the process that I talk about. And then I went online to check in online and I had got a free upgrade. So it, it happens. It's something because I have learned, I've trained myself not to be concerned with the how. Once I reach that point of conviction, mm -hmm. which is a word people will recognize from Neville, that this thing is already done and I'm no longer looking for it or no longer trying to make it happen, 
then I know it's going to show up however it shows up. So it, in my case, it was a free upgrade. It was absolutely fantastic. And all of the things that I imagined experiencing is what I experienced and more. It was even better than I had imagined. So um, this is what we're saying to people that I love what you said earlier on. Sorry to go on. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, no. Uh, you said something you said earlier on about people feeling that they're victims and all of that. And, and there is a way to overcome that. And this is what I'm so passionate about teaching people. Well, I, I and again, the exercises are in your book. I, I, you know, you're not you're not just telling stories about how something worked for you. You're giving people the tools to actually make this a, a part of their own reality. And and I want to emphasize that over and over again. This is not just a how great I am book. This is a this worked for me, and this is this is an exercise that you can work on that will help you to make it a part of your life as well. So that, so that it's, it's um, the book, is, though small, it, it has a, a powerful message and the tools to make it, make it happen in your own life. And, but again, it, it's work. It's, it's, I mean, I, I, when I, when I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, it took three years for it to go away. But I just knew that it was going to go away. And and when it happened, it was kind of like, oh, this is a learning experience, you know. Man, I can't be far from a bathroom, so I've got to do other things with my time. So it, it was not a, it, it wasn't, I didn't look upon it as punishment or a curse. It was a lesson in many things. And once I had embraced the lessons, it went away. But it took three years. You know, I was slow. Um, but but those three years were wonderful years because, frankly, I got a lot of reading done because I kept books in the bathroom. I mean, it's you know, it, it was it was an inconvenience, only in that, you know, that's where I had to be. I didn't look upon it as an inconvenience. I looked upon it as a gift in order to give me time to do other things that I had to do. So. It's, it's perception. It's how you look at it. It's how you work with it. And no matter what it is you're looking at, whether it, it is not having the money that, that you, you know, need to do certain things, you can make that happen. But you need to put the time in. I, I, I think so many people look at things like the abilities and the talents that you've created and think, well, I couldn't do that, you know, and, and it's, the reality is everyone can do that. What, what you have done is, is what we're supposed to, to know before we even walk that we can do. It, it's, it's a matter of, of embracing the philosophy that all things are, and, and in the Bible, all things are possible. Come on. Absolutely. It, the message is there. It's just that it's been misinterpreted for so long that we don't listen to the meaning that is actually behind the words. Absolutely. I love, love, love what you've just said. And I, I, I think when you're talking, I, I can imagine, you know, in ancient Greece, these arenas where great crowds would gather to <laughs> share these their stories and, and this philosophy. And I can just imagine, you know, a, a whole community of people talking about experiences like this. It's so wonderful to know that our experiences, as he was alluding to, Barbara, are individualized. They are really personalized to suit what we need as an individual. And it doesn't matter what we think we can't do. It's so important that we put in the work and you've emphasized that so beautifully I'm just so excited by what you're saying it's absolutely true in my own life it took me a long time um, to get to where I am now but I what I love about it I think a lot of my confidence in this philosophy is that this is what someone else told me that it worked for them mm -hmm. and they told me how it how to do it and how to go about it and I applied it and it worked for me in the way that they described. And so I'm now passing that message on. And I really get excited about the idea that someone else will then pass the message on to someone else. And this is how this word gets disseminated. But I love the fact that God has gifted humanity. He's put us here to do something according to his divine will. But he's put 
amongst, amongst us this wonderful message that's going to liberate us and set us all free. And it really is a question of perspective. I, I, I just think it's so important. And I'm so happy that you said that. Um, so eloquently. Oh, thank you. Well, well, you know, somebody once said to me, you know, you're not God. And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they, and, and, you know, the, I was getting heckled and someone said, you know, can you walk on water? And, and I said, of course I can. Everybody can. Of course, in my case, it needs to be frozen, but yes, yeah. I can walk on it, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so it's not, I don't have to do that. And, and the thing is, there, there's an amazing message here. And I just can't believe I never heard of him before. Because, you know, the more I researched, the more I thought, come on, he was, he was around, you know, when I was getting involved in all of this. But, you know, every time I think I, I have, you know, scraped the bottom of the barrel, I find the barrel has, you know, a deeper bottom <laughs> than I thought, which is so exciting in this field. But but so today, so many people are going through such turmoil within their lives and looking for an answer and looking for a way of controlling things. And we're coming into a time when there is going to be more chaos than, than normal. And to have the knowledge that we have the ability to, to ease this passage into a new time frame um, to make it not only a smooth ride, but a first class ride if we want to, that, that, that that is a power that we have. And to not access that power just seems dumb. I mean, <laughs> you know, basically. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Neville says he he can use some quite harsh language. He says, you know, you'd have to be really stupid to have this ability to change your experience and not want to do anything about it. Or you'd have to be really foolish to just give in to what you think are facts about what's going on. I think the thing that's really important and one of the things that is certainly in my work that I aim to do is to help people understand that what has been misconstrued is not the trauma that people are going through or the chaos or whatever, the turmoil, but what it what it is teaching you as an individual. You go through things to exercise this ability within yourself. And if you just see it as a course of education, your whole relationship to life changes. And I bring into that all of the good that we experience and all of the bad, all of it is educative. And for me, just that shift in perspective enabled me to reposition myself as someone who uh, sees a challenge as a test or whatever, something I must overcome. So I need to look inside myself, find the solution to that issue and be the solution. And that's what it is. Once you learn how to do that, you never forget. And this is what we're doing. We're going through life, having our good times, and all of a sudden, some unpleasant surprise might show up. But it's not there to take you out or for you to sit in a corner and mope. It's to help you recognize that you have this ability to be, do, and have anything you want to be, do, or have in life. And that's the bit that I love about this work and living by this philosophy. It really has transformed my life. Oh, obviously. And you know, I, I think it's, you know, the fact that you have used it, it has, it has served you well. Neville used it. It served him well. It's not like, you know, you're, you're picking up a book that is he said, he said, he said, he said, you know, and it's like the, the nephew of, of my brother-in-law, his mother heard this and she told it to somebody who told it to somebody <laughs> else who then put it in practice and it worked, um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> your first hand, which I think is is great, and so was he. And and again, he used it um, in, in in order to enrich his life as well. And but not to become, you know, rich and famous to to live a, a prosperous, joyful life, which is mm -hmm. you know what what he he was here to do. And. You know, if, if he had ended up, you know, a multi-billionaire, um, you know, the story wouldn't be so easy to sell. It's easy to sell because he didn't take it too far. Absolutely. I mean, he spoke about um, his – he was comfortably off. I, left, I think he left his – children, his son and daughter, I think several million dollars in today's money. So it wasn't that he didn't have money. He, he actually spoke once in a lecture 
about someone who had said, well, it's all right for you. You've got a million dollars in the bank. And he was saying, well, I'm not sort of trying to have money or amass wealth because that's not where my attention is. My attention is on the world to come. My focus is on the promise, not on doing what I'm now teaching you because I've done that. I fulfilled that part of my mandate. And I, I love that. I mean, in my own life, I'm comfortably off, but I love the fact that I am who I am. I, I have what I have, that it's not overblown because I'm telling people that I didn't come to this through connections or um, an abundance of resources. I came to this from very little and I have created the life that I have now. And actually, although I live modestly, I do that because my attention is not, I'm not as attached to the human experience as all that now. So I am looking for something else at this point in my life. But I feel so privileged, as you were saying, for being firsthand. I feel so honored to be a contemporary example of this philosophy. And that's what's important to me. So it's beautiful the way all of this comes together. It is. And, you know, it, I, I once, um, I, I served for five years in the pulpit, and, and one Sunday I handed out <clears throat> quartz hearts, little quartz hearts to everybody, and I said, I want you to hold this in the palm of your hand as tightly as you can. Just grip it. And I want white knuckles here. And, you know, I kept talking, and I kept saying, I want your hand to cramp. I want you to understand you're holding it tightly for fear it's going to fly away, for fear that it, you're going to lose it if you don't hold it. And, you know, I got to the point where I could see people were really in pain, and I said, now I want you to release it, and, and I want you to let, just let it rest in your palm. And they did, and I said, it will stay with you forever. That's love. That's, that's what love is. The tighter you hold it, the harder it gets. The more you cradle it and embrace it, the longer it stays, the more powerful it becomes. And that was like 20, 30 years ago. And people to this day will come up to me, reach in their pocket and show me their heart and say, I still have it. And, you know, it's, it's magical and, and it's, it's personal experience when you give somebody that something to go back to, to represent, you know, you, you're, you speaking, telling your message is like that heart. And if people take it, embrace it and practice it, it endures forever. That's such a wonderful, uh, I don't want to say story, but yes, a wonderful um, anecdote. <laughs> very, very wonderful. I love that. Thank you. I, I have been gifted with bunches of them, um, only, only because, you know, it's, you, you, you want to illustrate things to people, but you want to illustrate them in a way that they can make it their own. Mm. And as soon as someone has a personal experience of anything, it is cemented within their consciousness. And that's, what his, that's why his work is so important for people to realize. All you need to do is to practice it. And, and you know, don't, don't pick, you know, I want to become, you know, Miss Universe or something like that. Pick something that is attainable to work on, you know, but, but that is, you feel is out of your reach a new car or a new job or whatever it is. But but pick something that that is a part of your reality to achieve and and work on it. Put it into practice. Take the time to do the the um, picturing. Understand that you're picturing it not as an observer but as a participant. And as soon as you become a participant in that we'll call it a vision, in that vision <laughs> The more you are able to live in that vision, the more that vision is drawn into your reality and it becomes your reality. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's really wonderful. Neville wanted to make um, the distinction clear between the general new thought message of the day where people would say visualize. And as you were saying, you're not looking at this picture like an observer. Rather than looking at actors on the screen, you are an actor in the scene. And that's the thing, the distinction that needs to be very, very clear. So I like that. And we step into that picture and that picture becomes our new reality. It, it does. And, you know, all of us have had those kind of quote unquote dreams that we could feel, smell, and touch things. And that's how, that's, that's the, 
level of consciousness you go into in order to do this kind of work. And you speak you speak basically of, you know, going into that time frame right right as you're going to sleep to do this work. And the, the really cool thing about this is our our subconsciousness, our to me the higher consciousness does not know the difference between a dream and reality. It takes, I mean, it takes them both as it, it takes it takes the dream and assumes its reality and helps you to create it. I mean, one of the things that's really fantastic that people will discover through using this work, through establishing that connection between their physical beings and their higher consciousness beings, is that when you close your eyes and you shut out the physical world around you, you're functioning as divine mind. You're functioning as the formless, as consciousness itself. And actually, as Neville says, consciousness is the only reality. It becomes so wonderfully tangible to you. And many people don't realize that they are having real experiences in dreams if consciousness is indeed the only reality. And so when you, once you start to become familiar with not just the terminology, but how it works in practice, it, this is, becomes a, a huge part of your ability to create what you're looking for. Because instead of the uh, dream just happening to you and you not really being in control of it, you then begin to craft them yourself. Yeah, it, and it's, it's really, um, it, it's sort of like when you're getting into that place between total awake and asleep, <clears throat> that's that's when that's when we're at that place where there is now the bridge to the higher consciousness the bridge to the <clears throat> the creator within us and and what you're doing <clears throat> excuse me what you're doing is creating that bridge so that the creator in us can cross the bridge and help us create the reality Absolutely. I mean, psychologists refer to that as the hypnagogic state. Some people may be familiar with that. And I have read, I, I'm sorry, I can't recall offhand that for people who work in creative, uh, in, in the creative industries, um, maybe they're designers or writers or musicians, they often access that state because it is the optimum state for inspiration, for creative inspiration. So just think that once you are in that state, what you have done is put down all of your logic and reason and all of your reasons or your excuses for why something cannot be and you're absolutely in one at one with all the things that are possible for you and as the title of my book says infinite possibilities you are really in uh, oh, accordance yeah. with all of that and that's the thing that's so beautiful it's important to get into that state well it, it, it's funny because the term I use all the time is logic and reason does not apply and, and and it doesn't. And um, when I created the deck of cards, I did. I you know, it you you tend to get into what runners call the zone. Um, I call it my click in place. A lot of people have a have a term for when I am totally open to inspiration from any from from the infinite. And 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 I go and I flow with it. It's it's where channeling comes from. It's the magic of, it's the magic of being a you know allowing that part of creation within you to flow into the reality that you are a part of and help you to change and shift it. And um and, and you you can use it for so many different things. You can use it for heck weight loss. You can use it for um for for you know winning elections you can't you can't exactly use it to influence other people though i guess you could it just is it's it's not advised because oh and that was the other thing in your book that that if you try to use it to influence someone else or to do something that is not a good thing it is just directed right back at you Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really important. Before I, I speak to that, Barbara, I just want to say I, I love what you just said, that it's really important for people to recognize that a lot of this philosophy is already in operation in their lives. Like you say, many people have words for, you know, being in the zone or that space or whatever. So this is a, a, a thing when we begin to actually identify how we're already using this philosophy in our lives, it makes the rest of the philosophy or the new parts of it more easier to embrace. So I, I just wanted to um, mention that. But just going on to what you were saying, Neville talks about um, 
you can use this power to influence people, if you like, or to in influence circumstances. But he said you become tyrannical. Yeah, it, and it's, it's, I mean, the, the, um, the pagans have this, this philosophy that, you know, what you send out returns back to you magnified greatly. And it's true. I mean, it, it, I'm, I'm not sure if it's in the Bible or not, but, but, um, well, and it's, it, it's, you know, basically do unto others, which is the oh, best. That's interest. And it's the same yeah. with evil. Oh, yeah. And there, there's also, um, Oh, let's see. It's the emerald tablets, as above, so below. I mean, there there are so many. It, it no matter what I love is that that these truisms have come through every every religious organization out there, every every philosophy that is out there. There are certain things that are true, no matter where you're coming from. They they they're universal. And and it's part of I believe what he speaks of as the law. Um, absolutely. I'm sorry, Barbara. I actually lost you for a bit there, so I didn't hear a lot of your last comment. If you could just, just say it again for me. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, the the um, the 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 element here of of you know what goes around comes around. The um, the element of uh, the golden rule, the, mm -hmm. you know, as above, so below, all of those qualities are, are integrated into every major religion and philosophy out there. There's got to be a reason that these universal truths or truisms are a part of everything. And that's because I do believe they are part of what he speaks of as the law. Absolutely, that's absolutely correct. And this is wonderful. I like the way that you brought, mentioned this because this philosophy um, isn't just another idea amongst a group of ideas, but all ideas exist within this philosophy. And so you will find threads of these useful universal truisms everywhere. In every religion, it's going to crop up because very, very often, perhaps in almost in, in every case, perhaps um, religions were founded by visionaries, people who actually worked with this philosophy in the first place and so you're going to find a lot of the same um, aspects or elements of the philosophy repeated right across the board well it's a method it's a teaching that has come through time and you know it's almost as though it's come through time there are there are times when people have embraced it and used it and then there are times that it's been rejected and neglected and I, I really believe that that his philosophy today is is will be more accepted than maybe it even was during his lifetime. So so it's it's kind of like it keeps coming back, it keeps coming around, and if it keeps coming back and coming around, there has to be a reason. Absolutely. Neville talks about the fact that this, that, which is part of the reason he said, don't look at me, Neville Goddard, look at me as a messenger of this truth. But he said, whenever it's necessary, someone will be sent into the world to share this message again, to remind us about it again. And um, even though he is one of three people who were prophetically spoken to deliver the message in the way that he did, because it was very, very different from the way that other people spoke, there will be those who come forward to to remind the world, the global community about this message. We're never going to be left without this information as, I mean, the human race cycling over and over again. Well, and, and you know, hopefully each time it comes back, um, more people become a part of it to the, to the point, to the time when everyone, you know, it's just, it's a given. It's not something you have to learn. It's something that you have already become. I think, Sorry, if I could just jump in. I think jump. one of the things I said in an interview um, last year, I think it was, that um, what Neville said was that it comes to people at the right time for them. So you were saying earlier on that um, you hadn't heard of him, but now you're speaking about it now because you're positioned to disseminate this message to a great audience, perhaps at the time um, that he was around, you weren't in that position to do that. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just speculating, but I'm saying that it's going to keep 
coming up time and time again so that everybody gets a chance to hear it. I don't, I'm not consciously aware of having heard this message before becoming Catherine, um, but I'm doing it now. And I'm, I love the fact that I'm doing it in the garment that I am in. My mum speaks about the time when she actually remembers being in his audience. So that's fantastic. She wasn't physically there, but she remembers being in his audience in a previous experience. <laughs> so it, it happens, you know, to people at different times. But as I was saying before, it's inevitable. It's something that we will all hear sooner or later. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, you give him credit, which is which is fabulous. And, you know, obviously, you're not looking, looking to be a guru walking through the wilderness, you know, spouting this. But but you practice it. It works for you. And, you know, that's that's the best sales sales pitch ever. I do this. It works. You know, try it. And, <laughs> and you know, if it doesn't work for you, then it's not your thing this time. But that's OK. Um, I, I think that, you know, frankly, Jesus did the same thing. And and, you know, Buddha did the same thing. His his thing was, you know. You know, come and see. If it doesn't work, don't don't use it. You know, the message eventually will be something that's a part of you, but it doesn't have to be right now. It's not a an absolute. You don't you don't get brownie points here or there or anywhere. It 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 means that you. And I've used this term, you know, a lot lately. Um, in, in taking tools like this and applying them to your life, turns your life from black and white to technicolor. <laughs> Absolutely, I love that. And actually, Neville does describe something about the world suddenly becoming this uh, image of vivid color. He says you, he, it was a way that he was trying to explain um, how this philosophy changed him. You see things in such um, beautiful, vivid, vibrant terms. <laughs> you do, and and it's it's you know certainly certainly I I. I haven't had the chance to, to play with it, and I think that's, though it's serious, I, I think I have to redefine my, my, my stuff here, but it's, it's important to play with all of this. It, it doesn't mean that you, you know, this is not a ritualistic thing. This is getting to know yourself and understanding yourself and applying tools to your reality. Absolutely. It is spiritual in that it puts you in closer contact with the spirit you carry within. There's a knowingness there that is really cool. But, but I, so many people do stuff like this and they take it as a religious endeavor. And to me, it, it, it doesn't work because it's not a religion. It's a philosophy. Absolutely. Um, I think it's in the Bible where it says that we should be as little children. And unless we are like little children, we cannot enter the kingdom. I think I've got that right. Correct me if I'm wrong. But that's very, very important. There's a chapter in the book that says fantasize with focus. I encourage people to play. It's very, very important that they don't see this as some sort of system of rituals or they attach any pageantry to it or anything like that, because that will actually shut down this philosophy working for you. When you actually are aware that you are following a set of rules or trying to perform some technique, what happens is that you are unable to engage as being real in the present, engage with the thing you desire as being real in the pre present. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that we have that childlike attitude. In my own experience, um, how that represents itself is that I don't question how. When you tell a child they're getting um, a gift, uh, they are not concerned with how you're going to give it to them. I have my nephew who I adore. He's eight years old. I made the mistake of promising him something when we were at the airport recently. <laughs> and every time he speaks to me is, oh, have you got my uh, my gift? And I have to give it. I'll, I'll see him in three weeks and I'll give it to him when I see him. But that's the beauty of children. They're not worried about whether you've got the money for it or not or how you're going to get it. They just know that they want that thing that was promised. And, and we need to have that attitude as well. Where is it? Where is it? I can't wait to see it. Not so much <laughs> as how, how am I going to get this? Well, yeah. And, and this is not something you practice this is a way of life this is you know I, I, I think that has to be made 
clear as well. This isn't something you turn off and turn on. This is something you become. Yes, I'm, I'm really glad that you said that. I'm, in my own experience, I had these kind of um, periods of, of being off and on. And I, would, I was concerned about the fact that um, I would be having this wonderful time and then all of a sudden things would start to unravel for me. And I didn't make that connection as quickly as I probably would do now that it's not an off and on thing. It really is a way of life. And so if I am not exercising my imagination or engaging it lovingly on behalf of myself or on behalf of someone else every single day, then it, it is easy to slip back into the system I know, into the world that I was born into rather than the world that I create. And, you know, it's 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 such a lovely offer on, on such a small book, but it, it does have the potential of shifting and changing your perspective, your reality and your consciousness tremendously. Um, <clears throat> it's so skinny, too. I mean, you know, it. <laughs> OK, I, I do want to speak about that. <laughs> yes, it is a little book. I, I'd like to say it's your pocket rocket. The thing about it for me, what I used to do when I was studying level or what I still do is I keep journals. And what I would do is I would um, in my journals or my diaries, I would write down something that really had an impact on me. And so while I was going through um, all of my journals and my notes across the years, I mean, I've got loads of things in storage. I wanted to put together um, a reference guide but not just a quick reference guide, a, a reference that really spoke to me, that was able to galvanize and energize me whenever I needed it, that got straight to the point, that was able to take me through the, te the techniques um, in a very clear and decisive way. And so I put them together in that way. And that's really where the book was born, where it came from. And um, I want this book to be an intimate friend of every reader, something that you feel that you can just delve into and to be carried away because it's you that are going to do the work ultimately I just need to tell you how it's done I don't need to go into you know spiels and you know um, great rambling speeches about what's going on I am handing over the controls to you but showing you how to get the ball rolling oh yeah and you know it's it's really I think also the fact that that you can go you you can Go back into your past and, and create better scenarios for things that have happened. I love that. I do that a lot. Um, so that so that it 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 has it it, it has it, it has the ability to smooth out um, a rough journey almost immediately. Absolutely. And, and I think so many people hold on to they have an angst. They have, they have um, emotional baggage that they're carrying. You, you don't have to. You can, you can, you know, use this practice, use this procedure, go back in time, and create a different scenario. In in many ways, there there are theories that that um, every lifetime is ongoing all at the same time. And, and in many ways, sort of, if you can visualize, there are many different ways you could have reacted to different situations. It's almost like you jumped to a different timeline in which you had a better, you know, better way of ending something. Some, usually, sometimes it's the end of a relationship or something like that. You can go back and you can recreate the ending in a more civil manner, so to speak, so that you're not carrying baggage or anger or, or regret with you. You're moving forward with, with, without carrying all of that emotional baggage. And, and you can do that. There's, there's no reason for you to hold on to things that are in the past. You can let go of them or you can go back and you can shift the, the way the experience came to an end into a more palatable formula for you. Absolutely. I think um, Neville calls that process revision. And for me, 
learning that technique, which was challenging for me. Others might not find it challenging to grasp, but it, it was one of the techniques that really made me feel that I was a powerful being. It had such an immense impact on me, not just because I was able to undo a traumatic event, but as you said, Barbara, that you use it in many different ways, and I do as well. It's interesting if I just take a minute here to explain something. I am often asked uh, to give examples of when I've used the, some of the techniques in my books in different interviews. So um, I refer to a technique, uh, Chapter 2, Magic Mirror, where I changed uh, a concept of myself, um, which uh, <clears throat> I, at the time I had terrible acne, and it was really debilitating. I actually didn't want to leave the house. It was causing me a lot of grief, and I used that uh, the technique to clear my skin. But actually what happened was I was holding on to something that I was really humiliated by in my uh, early 20s, and that showed itself by this terrible acne that nothing the doctor did could change and I was able to clear it up but it happened as a result not just using the magic mirror technique but as a result of going back and changing that event and letting it happen in the way that I wanted it to and instantly I did that to the point of conviction I was free from the effects of that event. So this, uh, what you've described, Barbara, and what Neville talks about is based on the premise that all events are rooted in consciousness mm -hmm. and consciousness is ours to control, for lack of a better word. It's, it's for us to remember that we are one with consciousness and that we can ask consciousness to do what we want it to do. And that's the bit that um, is, for me, very important about what you've talked about. Kind of interesting that you couldn't face something and it manifested on your face. Absolutely. That's exactly what happened. Wow. <laughs> yeah, no, that, it, it, it does work that way. Consciousness is, is, you know, I'm not a psychologist. I mean, I, I taught school for 25 years, so I had my fair share of psycho, you know, psychology. But, but I am finding the, the, the spiritual or the metaphysical whatever word you want to use is so literal. Um, quite often, if, if you are being a pain in somebody's neck, you, you sometimes can manifest that within a pain in your own neck um, so, that, so that there is a literacy, a literal aspect of all of this. But, but we have the power, and, and it comes back to that. We have the power. Um, to shift and change focus and, and to recreate and to to even change how we see ourselves so that so that it, it's really a tool that that gosh you know he's right you'd be stupid to not apply it absolutely you know and Barbara as you're talking I'm registering that this part of the conversation is really going to mean something to your listeners and so I want to talk about um, another author Florence Scovel Shin who talks about what we've just discussed in such incredible terms she uh, excites me a great deal her writing and she really does pinpoint how our physical ailments and these physical manifestations of discomfort and dis-ease are connected to these various consciousnesses. So I just wanted to mention that here because I felt that this part of the conversation will register for some people in a very deep way. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's just <clears throat> that the mirror is so important, not only in how we see ourselves, but our actions and our, and our philosophies. Um, I have a neighbor who... Um, because I bought the house I bought doesn't like me because she didn't like the people that were in the house before. I, I got guilt by association. But she was really mean. And in my younger years, um, I had a sharp tongue. I had a terrible tongue. I really could rip somebody to pieces easily. And, and I did it beautifully. I've got a great vocabulary. I could really do a great – I mean, I was good. And she um, – she she had it out for me for some reason, and I, I had to walk by her property to get to another part of my property, and she would always have nasty and vicious things to say, and, and it was almost like I was up for the challenge. My, my sleeves were rolled up, and I realized that she was ripping me apart to pieces. You know, first of all, this is no challenge. I can slice her and dice her any way I want, but, but the other part that came through at one point was, this is a mirror for you. 
if you sink to her level, you become her. Absolutely. And oh my goodness, did that change everything? <laughs> you know, well, not totally. I really kind of still wanted to go at it, but but the reality, I didn't. I told her she her garden looked pretty, and I walked on. But but after the fact, it was like whoa, that was some that 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 was a, a an aha moment for me that that you know i could have gotten into it with her and i would have felt really good that i had really shafted her good but but the reality was i saw what i was going to become if that happened and there's no way i was going to become that lady <sighs> That is such an important thing you've just said, Barbara, and I absolutely love it because this is what makes this philosophy a whole life thing and um, so complete in every way. So for many people, metaphysics is about that new car, that job, that partner for some people, who, whatever it might be, but actually it's these awarenesses as well. It's a, a complete course. It's a, it's a complete overhaul of the, the human experience. And I just, um, I absolutely love what you've just said. Yeah, it was, it was one of those defining moments that gave me a sermon. <laughs> but, but it is also a moment that, that, you know, is constantly there for me, you know, is this what you want to become? Is this what you feel life is about? And and no, it's not what I want to become. So, you know, it did change my life. It shifted my, am I going to send her a thank you note? No way. But, but you know, maybe next life. But, but it, it's, you know, it's those kind of things that Neville's work opens you up to. And you don't have to, you know, experience those kind of experiences because, because he gives it to you. It's, it's in the book, you know. And, and, and the other part, too, is if you, if you don't like even the way you look, you can, you can use his method to change the of it. There, there is that, that amazing connection. Mm -hmm. We have the ability to to work with it if we choose to. And that, I think, is the important thing. It, it's, it's, I choose to make a change. I choose to make a change in my life. And, and once you choose to make that change, then you have to, that, then you do the work. Then you, then you do the, the, um, the letting go of what you think and what you feel in creating a new persona, a new direction, a new way of, of, of projecting yourself into you. In many ways, you project yourself into a new reality. Um, absolutely. And, and the thing that I love about this choice is at the point of making that choice, you are actually recognizing that you have the authority to make the change. And so it's just a question of getting to grips with how you do that or really um, establishing a strong connection that enables you to do that or um, stepping into the practice of doing that in, in practical terms. But it's beautiful that at the point of making the choice, you actually acknowledge your divinity, your ability to do whatever you need to do. Well, I think you move from authority into power. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you're not asking permission. You're, I'm doing this. Yes. And, and, and when you get to the I'm doing this, then, then there is no stopping you. It's so, fantastic. <laughs> so it's, it's giving yourself permission, I guess, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, and, and it's kind of because I think for me personally, at the point of choosing, at the point of recognizing your authority, at the point of stepping into that power, your perspective changes. It has to, <clears throat> because what Neville said is that you, you give up your belief in the systems that you were born into, you know, our education system, the health system, the law and order, whatever it might be we no longer defer to the authority of those systems, but we're now looking to our own internal, excuse me, our internal power. Well, you know, there have been cultures, there have been times in time where, where people have utilized these, these tendencies, these skills, and, and they ha it's been a part of consciousness. It's been a part of their reality. What happened that we lost it? 
I think um, as, as Neville talks about us, we were emptied of memory for the purpose of regaining this power. I can't remember off the top of my head which lecture he talks about this in, but it was necessary for us to forget. It was necessary for us to create this world in which it appeared that everything we needed was available to us, albeit on a temporary basis, as a result of what we as physical beings could do. And once those systems began to fail us, we would then regain or uh, reestablish that connection, remember who we are, through having to look to alternative means for giving ourselves the things that we need. So we see that demonstrated in the, in the sort of turmoil that happens, the health challenges, that you think how far science has come, medical science has come, deliberately so, and then you find that it has its limits. The world of finance has its limits, and all of these different systems have their limits, so that we then begin to function as consciousness for a purpose that is then revealed to us later on. So, as I said before, this is why this philosophy takes courage, because you're kind of wondering, what is this all for? But you do come, um, get to know the reason, and that's the thing that's most um, empowering and enlightening. Okay, so, so we, we, we become one with the law and we, we live the law, the next step is the promise. And you don't really go into that in the book, and yet that was very important to him. Yes, I mean, the reason why I didn't go into that in the book was, I, as Neville says, I wanted to put first things first. So I wanted this book to be something that someone who had never heard of this philosophy before could pick up and embrace. And I think if you're coming to this um, from a secular background, perhaps an atheistic or agnostic background, or even a religious background, um, the promise and what Neville describes as being the promise might be something that's a little bit too much for people to uh, absorb at that time, so I go into it in my second book, but the promise is when we actually have completed the mandate that we've been given through all the lifetimes that we have while we're on uh, in the world doing what we need to do. It is actually something as mm -hmm. we have the ability to to work with it if we choose to. And that I think is the important thing. It, it's it's I choose to make a change. I choose to make a change in my life. And and once you choose to make that change, then you have to that then you do the work. Then you then you do the the um the letting go of what you think and what you feel and creating a new persona, a new direction, a new way of 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 projecting yourself into you in many ways you project yourself into a new reality um absolutely and and the thing that i love about this choice is at the point of making that choice you are actually recognizing that you have the authority to make the change and so it's just a question of getting to grips with how you do that or really um, establishing a strong connection that enables you to do that or um, stepping into the practice of doing that in, in practical terms. But it's beautiful that at the point of making the choice, you actually acknowledge your divinity, your ability to do whatever you need to do. Well, I think you move from authority into power. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you're not asking permission. You're, I'm doing this. Yes. And, and, and when you get to the I'm doing this, then, then there is no stopping you. It's so, fantastic. <laughs> so it's it's giving yourself permission, I guess, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, and, and it's kind of because I think for me personally, at the point of choosing, at the point of recognizing your authority, at the point of stepping into that power, your perspective changes. It has to <clears throat> because what Neville said is that you, you give up your belief in the systems that you were born into, you know, our education system, the health system, the law and order, whatever it might be we no longer defer to the authority of those systems, but we're now looking to our own internal, excuse me, our internal power. Well, you know, there have been cultures, there have been times in time where, where people have utilized these, these tendencies, these skills, and, and they ha it's been a part of consciousness. It's been a part of their reality. What happened that we lost it? 
I think um, as, as Neville talks about us, we were emptied of memory for the purpose of regaining this power. I can't remember off the top of my head which lecture he talks about this in, but it was necessary for us to forget. It was necessary for us to create this world in which it appeared that everything we needed was available to us, albeit on a temporary basis, as a result of what we as physical beings could do. And once those systems began to fail us, we would then regain or uh, reestablish that connection, remember who we are, through having to look to alternative means for giving ourselves the things that we need. So we see that demonstrated in the, in the sort of turmoil that happens, the health challenges that you think how far science has come, medical science has come, deliberately so, and then you find that it has its limits. The world of finance has its limits, and all of these different systems have their limits so that we then begin to function as consciousness for a purpose that is then revealed to us later on. So as I said before, this is why this philosophy takes courage, because you're kind of wondering, what is this all for? But you do come, um, get to know the reason, and that's the thing that's most um, empowering and enlightening. Okay, so, so we, we, we become one with the law and we, we live the law, the next step is the promise. And you don't really go into that in the book, and yet that was very important to him. Yes, I mean, the reason why I didn't go into that in the book was, I, as Neville says, I wanted to put first things first. So I wanted this book to be something that someone who had never heard of this philosophy before could pick up and embrace. And I think if you're coming to this um, from a secular background, perhaps an atheistic or agnostic background, or even a religious background, um, the promise and what Neville describes as being the promise might be something that's a little bit too much for people to uh, absorb at that time. So I go into it in my second book. But the promise is when we actually have completed the mandate that we've been given through all the lifetimes that we have while we're on uh, in the world doing what we need to do. It is actually something, as Neville describes, that is spiritually discerned. And so if somebody doesn't or isn't at that stage in their journey, they're not going to understand what it means. But it's the point at which we are no longer limited by our physical human forms. And Neville describes that is spiritually discerned. And so if somebody doesn't or isn't at that stage in their journey, they're not going to understand what it means. But it's the point at which we are no longer limited by our physical human forms. And and so why, when you get back to London, why don't you... Um shoot me a message or something and we will we will do some more on Neville Goddard yeah that would be amazing I, Thank I you. seem to know more about his 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 philosophy than I thought well it's really funny what because so much of what you were saying is the philosophy you know it, it's it's not even different in any way <laughs> you were just saying so it was wonderful to hear you speak about it well, he seems to be synchronized to to my belief system for sure, and and so you know I think we can help people out. I really do. I think there is a um, a, a wonderful like I like I was saying at some point um, messages come back over and over and over again throughout time, and I think that his message is one that has come into a time that will be more accepting of it than in the past. Sure. So I was just wondering, do you want to record like a, a closing for the show? Or? Yeah, I think I'll just put this in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and because this is recording again. So, okay. um, so let me just check. Yep, it is definitely still recording. And, and you know, I, I just want to, I want to thank you so very much. I so appreciate your taking the time to share your, your experiences and, and your love of his material. Thank you, Barbara. You know, these conversations feed me literally and figuratively, <laughs> but they really are important for me um, to, to exercise what I'm saying and what I'm doing. And it keeps me on my toes. So I really enjoyed speaking to you. Well, it was a pleasure. And, and you know, again, I, I will be very happy to have you on again and we can go into his material still further. Um, I, I would like there is another book. I didn't realize you had another book. I thought this is the one that just came out. 
Um, oh, yes, it, it is. Um, I haven't actually finished my second book, but I, I just wanted to make that distinction because I do get asked, um, do you go into the promise and things like that? So mm -hmm. I just wanted to men mention that. But yes, well, it isn't out yet. <laughs> do, you, do you have any idea when it's coming out? Um, I'm finishing edits, um, so uh, I will keep people posted on social media for those who follow me on Facebook. Um, I haven't really got a date yet. Okay, well, when you do, I want to be in line to, to get get one of the first copies so that we can go into in depth what the promise is, because I think we, we touched the truth quite well here today, the, the law. I agree. And, I agree. But, but do, do keep in touch with me, because I would love to have you on again. And and um, you know when you're when you're back in England, it'll probably be an easier connection. But yeah. even though we got interrupted, and I love the fact that as soon as I asked about the promise, you started to drop away. So obviously, it just wasn't the time. No. <laughs> thank you so much, Barbara. I had a great time. I did too, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Okay. Bye bye, -bye. Bye -bye now.